Paulus is introducing a new prescription for security, and it's free. Global IT Asset Discovery and Inventory. Activate it today at securityweekly.com forward slash Qualys so you can achieve 100% near real-time visibility across your hybrid environments. Are you an enterprise dissatisfied with overpriced analytics software that can't keep up with modern data? If so, then GraphWell is the solution for you. GraphWell is an unstructured data analytics platform for enterprises who demand total data visibility across their network. GraphWell lets your security team go beyond the SIM and fuse data sources to correlate and answer questions you didn't know needed to be asked. Go to graphwell.io forward slash security weekly for an unlimited data trial and gain uncompromising visibility today. Welcome back, everyone, to Paul's Security Weekly. Quick announcement, Ocean and the Pell Center are partnering together for a Cybersecurity Exchange Day, right, Exchange Day even right here in Rhode Island. It's happening on March 18th from 8 a.m. to 3 p.m. Salve Regina University is the place to be on that day, securityweekly.com forward slash Ocean 2020. You can register for free. Come to Rhode Island. Come to a conference in beautiful Newport. Hang out with the Security Weekly crew as well as many other uh, folks. Did you know Mark Dietrich? Sounds familiar. He was at Brown's Computer Science Department. Um, When I spoke with him, I I really truly believe he has forgotten more about Linux than I will ever know. Um, And he will be there. He's actually the director of information services at Brown University now. Yeah, it's really... I I can't wait to catch up with Mark. Uh, Joe Pangborn, you remember Joe Pangborn? Yeah, I do. Uh, He works at the Naval Warfare College. College. Yep. uh, And he will be there. And he used to be the director of IT at Roger Williams. He was the director of IT at Roger Williams. In fact, I did some some work for Joe while I was... When I I worked worked for Ocean. Yeah. I I, I remember one of those vulnerabilities that you found that... 88.3, 88.3, that's all I'm going to say. Yeah. <laughs> very well could have been vulnerabilities. Yes, very well could <laughs> have been. I will been. neither confirm, confirm nor, nor deny yeah. uh, that there were vulnerabilities. So, hey, uh, that's my line. That's right. <laughs> I have to borrow one of Jeff's lines for that one. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it's going to be a great day. Uh, make sure you come here to Rhode Island at, on that day and hang out with and us. It, and if all goes well, I will be there as well. Oh, it's be awesome. It'll be lots of fun. Lots Love of fun. to have you. Um, so... I, maybe we should just start with the Apache Tomcat one because uh, specifically it, Tyler and I have been. You want to, and Tyler wants to go. Well, because uh, we saw this, and I was like, "Well, that's interesting." Yet another Apache. I mean, Apache Tomcat has had certainly, I would say, more than its fair share of vulnerability. Not yeah. that it's had them, but it's it, it, the folks have coded those into Apache Tomcat for Their features. A really long. I mean, Tomcat goes. I remember Tomcat four, and now we're on nine. And there, I think there's every major version in between there. Um, and they're just all riddled with vulnerabilities. I had not used it in a really long time. I actually I did. remember before there was Tomcat, so there. I remember before there was Tomcat as well. Uh, but Java was certainly really popular, especially in the late 90s. In fact, when I got uh, my information systems degree... I took the first Java programming course at my school, um, and, and that was in you know ninety eight or ninety nine, mm-hmm. and and that's when I was and largely we're... working with it, and it you know to go back to it today, I was like, oh, this looks kind of familiar. I, I you know it kind of came back to me, um, but there are some interesting set of vulnerabilities in Apache Tomcat. Uh, they affect major versions. I think seven, eight, and nine. Tyler, is that? Is that true? Yeah, I think that's right. Yeah. And uh, so there's three. Uh, one is you can read all of the files that are accessible in the web directory. And Tomcat has a kind of really strange way in XML files of basically it creates almost like a namespace of like files it's going to serve. And this exploit gives you access to all of those. Mm-hmm. Some of those could actually be configuration files like XML configuration files, which are also, like, really just terrible. Like, they haven't come onto JSON yet. <laughs> like, really, really bad. Uh, so, XML. Yeah, that that's the part I was trying to get working and largely kind of failing. Tyler, you might have gotten a little further than, than I did uh, today. but um, So that's one vulnerability. The other vulnerability is if uploads are enabled, and a lot of this does depend on the configuration, you can upload a file and make any file be interpreted as a JSP file, Java server pages. So effectively, with the upload, 
and the execute, it is a remote code execution. But that's the part that's kind of kind of shady for me. Tyler, I don't know how yeah, far you got on, on some of this research. <coughs> you started, I yeah. think, when the uh, exploit was first released. There is an exploit in exploit DB. It, it does not work. There are both bugs. And I asked Tyler this question. <laughs> oh, my God, there are bugs, like general bugs, and there are bugs that are put there on purpose so that, like, people don't pwn the world and, and mess mm -hmm. stuff up that don't know what they're doing. And he's like, yeah, both. I'm like, great. Yeah, the answer is yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, and they're kind of dick moves, too. Like, they're not, like, they just stop the script kitty and they frustrate the rest of us who just expect that, you know, we can kind of modify this a little bit, but it made you I don't read know. the code. So. I found, I found two <clears throat> and like, it, it wasn't cause mostly my Python code is pretty terrible. So I was like, Oh, these are like mistakes that I would make. <laughs> right. One was, uh, <laughs> Uh, and, and Joff, uh, feel free to chime hey, in on this. Joff had, Joff had to bail. Oh, Joff had to bail. He did? Oh, yeah. What? That's too bad. No. Oh, no. Joff is still here. He's I'm still not here. dead yet. Yeah. <laughs> so, Joff, one was, uh, it was socket, and it was the buff size uh, parameter, which in later versions of Python is deprecated. Is that sound familiar? Or? Uh, 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 buff size for what? When you're it's a, a socket? Yeah, it's a parameter for the socket creation. I actually don't know whether that was deprecated or not. Uh, I, I don't expect you to know every line of Python either. And, and either very, way, why don't you just use Python 2.7 to run that? Instead of the other one was in the print statement uh, at the end. Um, it was the error that I got back was basically like, hey, I'm trying to print a string, but I got a series of bytes. So like basically all you have to do is no, put a, no, that, that's a that's a Unicode. Uh, that's a Unicode versus byte object issue. Right. So I put a B uh -huh. in front of it and it worked. Right. So. Right, because you converted it to object. Right. The, the, the thing about Python 3, and I can, I can get on my high horse a little bit here, uh, Python 3 actually interprets all strings um, as Unicode, um, well, not right. really as Unicode, as UTF-8, yep. uh, which is a flexible Unicode, um, which uh, it can encode from anywhere up to uh, one byte all the way up through four, uh, depending on the uh, um, the the most significant bits in uh, the the first byte encountered, um, which is uh, problematic because in Python 2 it was originally a, a string object, which was just a sequence of bytes. It was only 7-bit ASCII, essentially. Right, which you um, get that friggin' error that I got this week, too, which is like cannot decode from J to JSON because yeah, it's so, Unicode. So th yeah. this, is, this is actually the number one issue that most people from even considering going to Python 3 because yep. they run into uh, string encoder decoder kind of issues and the difference between byte and string objects and they just don't understand it and yep. they don't want to take the time to look it up. But if you uh, actually understand the fact that there is a distinctly a byte object in Python which is 100% compatible with a string object in Python 2, then you you kind of break through that barrier. I got gotcha. you. Once you get that you're you're good to go, and you just have to learn how to encode and decode between the two object types. Which in in, in the request library is typically where I run into this, and it does get extremely frustrating because you don't necessarily know what's being returned back, and you have to work mm -hmm. with that data. And I I get that you know, the Unicode uh, you know no JSON object to decode error all the time, and it's not right. because it's not returning JSON; it's because of the Unicode in, in, in byte encoding, right? Well, so so the thing the thing to keep in mind, Paul, the number one thing that you should probably uh, just put in your head right now is if you're dealing with network, 90% of the time what you're going to get back is a byte object. Yeah. Because that's what network is. And so if you just understand that you need to convert that back to a string object, you're okay. You're, you're um, requests is actually a little bit unusual. They have a couple of different objects in in the uh, response objects one is the text object as yep. well as the content object and and one of them has a byte and one of them is a string so um, you can actually run into trouble there and you need to be a little bit careful yes you need to read and do your research in both two python 2 and python 3 and how, how it deals with all that stuff it really yeah. turned me on to teaching mode man i was just i'm in oh, i love it i love teaching. it uh, so uh, Tyler, so we we fixed a couple of bugs in the thing. So how far did you get with with this whole process? I'm trying to get the the JSP file like to upload and do what I want it to do, and that's mm -hmm. where it was running into errors. Right? Uh, I heard some other people messing around with uh, downgrading HTTP, changing the 
uh, encoding methods in order to uh, upload different types of files that do interesting things. Uh, there's a whole bunch of kind of buzz around that, but I, I only got to the point where it was trying to get the JSP to execute, and that part was not working. So right. that's the other part that's confusing, is it is it actually three separate bugs where you have the read, uh, the file inclusion, and then the remote code execution, or is file inclusion with remote code execution <laughs> based on what you're providing it a separate kind of bug? Right. And, and, and Tomcat's really interesting, too. Um, so one of the things I did, and I think really what I learned from this uh, project and where most of my time was focused was, how do I stand up a Tomcat instance inside of a container? <laughs> this is great. Right? And make yeah. it really super vulnerable, right? Like, I wanted to remove all barriers because I'm like, well, if this is a, a vulnerable Tomcat instance, I want to keep this around for a while so that I can further and in, in keep testing yep. Tomcat. And so I did some tricks. In, I mean, if you're interested, send me an email, and I'll totally share my files with you. I don't have them on a public Git repo, but I, I, I will. You should. I, I will do that because uh, I'm more than happy to share. You, you need to update. We need to up our Security Weekly GitHub. I agree. Cred, street cred. Basically, what I built uh, accomplishes a few things, right? One is um, if you can build a vulnerable Tomcat version, mm -hmm you can then test not just e exploitation, right? But you can also test your defenses. You can say, sure. well, if I put up a, you know, a a Tomcat instance, a I can test my WAF, WAF I can like test my like container firewall. security yeah. technology, Absolutely. I can test my network, whatever it is, right? I can test that and see that if I do exploit a Tomcat instance, um, what that is. Also, you gain knowledge of the configuration things that you should never do in Tomcat in mm. production. And, and see what the consequences are of that and understand how to build it both securely and insecurely. So when I built my Tomcat instance, the first thing I did was the Docker Hub repos, basically, and the Tomcat website, right, are promoting 9.0.3.1, which is the latest and greatest version of Tomcat, which fixes this particular issue that we're talking about. So I said, well, I want to just go back one version. I'm like, I'll use version 9. Of course, there's version 8 and version 7, mm -hmm. but I'll use version 9. I want to go to 9.0.3.0. So I, uh, the, what you need to do the first step is not use their, their Docker Hub image because that's going to always build the latest and greatest version, which has the fixes. You don't want that in this case. For production, you want that. You want to have a CI CD pipeline. Damn it, if you're running Tomcat, you better be on the latest version or you're, you're really screwed because I looked at some of the bug history and like, and all of us as pen testers are laughing, right? Because Tomcat's something we've been able to take advantage of for a long time. So be in the latest version. For this test, I went back a revision, so you have to update the version. Num so I stole their Docker file. I put it back a version. You have to then go grab the SHA-256 hash of the previous version, which is all on Tomcat's website. So I did that. And then you can build a previous version of Tomcat. And it comes up in a container. But the default configuration, especially in version 9, because they've learned from previous versions, they've actually done a decent job of like making sure you don't shoot yourself in the foot. So they disable all the examples and the manager, Tomcat manager and host manager by default. They, and they do that by basically not providing any context of what IP address can access the manager. None of the apps are there. And they don't provide you with a username and password uh, for to access and actually log into the manager. So they basically like neuter all that functionality that throughout time has been awesome for us attackers. Uh -huh. They neuter that. So my container then, my config, is I build a Tomcat container yep. that any IP address can connect to the manager. The manager is in fact enabled. All the sample apps are enabled. And there's a uh, username and password of like admin password love is what I what I chose mm -hmm. uh, for my pet, which ties into another story, uh, and stands up the Tomcat container <laughs> as as very picture. vulnerable. So again, I'm more than happy to share that because I think you should have that around. You have to understand how the vulnerabilities present themselves, how the exploitation happens, to test that in your environment, to test your defenses, uh, and really just understand how to exploit an application before you can understand how to defend it and, and mm -hmm. push it forward and also understand how that configuration, what vulnerable versus not vulnerable looks like. So there are ways. Um, the other thing is there's this uh, AJP service is what's exploitable. It runs on port 8009. It's essentially like 
a PHP HP uh, FPM or a UW SGI. It's kind of like their uh, best I can tell, like their app server. So a lot of production deployments will put Apache or Nginx in front of this service. So your uh, HTTP requests come into Apache or Nginx. In the back end, it's sending it to the a AJP service, which speaks the AJP protocol, uh, which allows it to talk directly to Tomcat. You never want to expose that port to the internet because attackers can interact with that directly and not go through the web server. Of course, they can also interact with it through the web server as well. So don't expose that port. There's also a key, uh, a secure configuration, Tyler, which I don't know if you looked into because we were trying to build vulnerable stuff, but there's a key, uh, uh, like an API key that you can uh, use to secure that communications as well, right? I actually didn't look into that. I'm, I was trying to build a production system like you were describing, you know, with yeah. the admin and the password and, and you know, exposed all the ports to, to all IPs. So I was really working on the production system deployment. Right. <laughs> Yeah. So uh, you, if you're using Tomcat, well, if you know you're using Tomcat, <laughs> you developers are still, you right? don't know it. Uh, that there's a, a laundry list of things you need to make sure that are disabled by default. Um, which even if you're running a vulnerable version, if you don't expose the AJP port directly, I, but you're still vulnerable though, because it's through the web server. You can still send those requests, right, Tyler? Yeah. Yeah. You can still send them. Yeah. So uh, configuration's important. Um, so Paul, at the risk of moving on, because I know you're excited to talk about Tomcat, um, I had an article that sort of picks up on where wait, you- Wait, one uh, more thing, Jeff. I just want to- Okay, one more thing. I just want to say uh, what I was telling Tyler earlier was there are directory traversal vulnerabilities that could present themselves either in the web server, like Nginx, or in Tomcat itself, that if you can traverse directories and read a file, if you can read the configuration file for the Tomcat manager, that username and password is in clear text. Once you have that username and password to the manager, if you log into the manager, you can upload a WAR file, which is just a packaged Java file, which you can upload a meterpreter, uh, you know, MS Venom, like create me a WAR file, reverse uh, TCP shell, um, and compromise the system. That that doesn't rely on these vulnerabilities necessarily. To me, when I did the research, I'm like, that's a way better way for people to compromise Tomcat. Uh, so again, it goes back to make sure in the latest version, make sure there's no vulnerabilities because combinations of some of these vulnerabilities to me were even more deadly than the latest exploit and, and vulnerability that mm. were publicized recently. Well, Tyler, any just... closing, closing thoughts on, on this issue? No, I mean, that's 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 the real key there. I, I think what was released publicly and, you know, a great example is that code being uh, semi buggy and or broken on purpose. Like, yep. I believe there are things there that that are not being considered or have been found and are not being either released or uh, there's multiple chains there that are going to become a, a big deal. So, like you said, get those configurations and make sure you're locking that stuff down because this is. This is exactly what we look for, and exactly like this is a, a great day at the at the at the office. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so the also the libraries are there to implement more functionality, but in the exploit code, they only uh, used a portion of those libraries. In other words, they're mm. only trying to retrieve files. There's ways to upload files and execute files, and all that was in the libraries they provided in the you know methods and functions, but they right. weren't implementing it. You could tell they did that on on, on purpose. Yep. So, so yeah, you you've got to do the heavy lifting if you want. You've yeah. got to be at least this tall to ride this ride. Right, and it, it's I mean not that I mean Tyler and I didn't put a ton of time in it, and we already you know made a significant amount of progress. So I mean it basically patch your stuff and configure it securely if you're running Tomcat, or you're going to be pwned <laughs> basically. That, Jeff, well, that's yeah. That's how we make everything secure. Yes, agreed. Yeah, I mean, it's a piece of cake. So you, you had mentioned, uh, uh, you said, if you're using Tomcat, and then you corrected yourself, if you know you're using Tomcat. Yes. I, I, I picked up this article, and it wasn't until I opened it up, I realized, oh, I know this guy. But uh, I think my article number one is... Well, I think uh, you were going to say article number two. Oh, yeah, Alan Friedman. Well, I'll get to number two, but okay. uh, number yeah, yeah. one is, why doesn't software get sold with a list of ingredients? So uh, Alan Friedman, who I think has been on uh, Application Security Weekly, if I'm correct. Uh, was it? I think it was. 
I think it was application yes, security, application security weekly. weekly. Yes, and I caught up. I saw him multiple times at RSA in various uh, venues. He was kind of like I all over too. the place. Yeah. Yep. He gets around. He's mm. a, he's a social butterfly, but uh, he's been working at um, the National Telecommunications and Information in- Administration, and he's promoting and speaking. I think he spoke at. Uh, I, I want to say he spoke at RSA. Uh, if not RSA, it was it was B sides, but uh, on something called the Software Bill of Materials, or mm-hmm. what he likes to call S bomb, which basically says when you're buying software, you should get a list of all the component parts that go into the software, so that you would know if you have if, a vulnerable if, version if you're of Tomcat. using Tomcat. Yeah. Right, right, right. You may not be so, buying Tomcat, right, but you're maybe buying or implementing software, and under the covers, they're using Tomcat, and you're like. Well, we can't run that version because well, well, Paul shit. and Tyler will pwn the crap out of that, right? <laughs> Even just based on a day's worth of research. So, right. Maybe. So, Maybe. shout out to Alan. I'll make sure he listens to to at least the new segment of this episode. ASW eighty eight. ASW eighty eight. Great. Thank you. Uh, while I'm on the subject, can I mention my second article? Yes, and this like really kind of was like your article, Jeff. It really was. Um, so I'm at RSA last week uh, with most of the crew. I had a press pass, so I got invited to all sorts of parties and events. I, I signed up to go to one that was a press-only uh, you know, party. It looked like a decent place. They had drinks and food, and which was really why I was going. It was, and it turned out to be a, a uh, you know an investor event. They wanted the press to meet you know, all the companies that they're investing in. Um, so I got there and I'm like, there's a bunch of people in suits and, you know, people all looking all business. Like I have this natural aversion to people in suits. In case you didn't know. And you, and uh, you were wearing a t-shirt and shorts. I was going to oh, say, yes. I've, I've never seen Jeff wear a suit before. And no, I, will. and I only, I only do suits at funerals these days. Weddings and funerals. Yeah. Nowadays it's mostly funerals. Unfortunately. And I was going to say, um, uh, wedding, weddings suit is optional. Yep. Yeah, I, my I, daughter got married last summer. I wore a Hawaiian shirt. Which I, I, was awesome. You know, Jeff, I was going to say the same thing. A number of years ago, uh, I was very anti suit and very anti corporate wear, and I wore Hawaiian shirts to work every day when I worked at the mm. hospital. And in fact, I actually didn't have a suit to wear to a wedding, so I had to wear a Hawaiian shirt. Right. It's awesome. Yeah, I, uh, I, I might buy a suit someday, but I, I hope. Tyler has a lot of really nice suits, and he wore a lot of them well, at RSA. And, I was and, jealous. And, and Tyler just discourages me from even bothering because he, he does it so well. <laughs> anyway, so I'm, I'm at this event, and I, I look around the room, and there's this guy with a, you know, kind of uh, long hair, ponytail, a beard that kind of you know would give Jack a, a run for the money. Uh, he must be yours. As I called him. And he was kind of hiding in a corner. So I went and I was like, do you mind if I sit with you? And we got to talking and we talked probably for an hour. And, you know, we were very comfortable. He's an old time. I mean, he's a journalist, but he's an old timer. Started off with Unix. I started off with Unix. So we had a lot of common. We were talking about, you know, the, the good old days and, you know, how things got started, how you got into the business and so on and so forth. And didn't think twice about it. Two days later, I get a, a DM from somebody saying, "Jeff, you're in an article." So that the, this is the article, and and it's this guy that I met just having a casual conversation. Wrote an article talking about time for cybersecurity to take back control of its story, and uh, I had mentioned to this guy, unbeknownst to, if you read the article, it talks about George Takei, who was the original Sulu from the original Star Trek, gave the opening keynote at RSA. And then uh, uh, Ro, Ro, help me out, Rohit Ga. I don't right. know how you pronounce his name. Right. Uh, he he gave uh, one of the early, uh, you know, not I guess early keynotes, uh, and he kind of he's RSA security, so he kind of runs the whole conference. Um, they were talking about how cybersecurity has kind of lost its way, and because it's 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 it, it used to be that. Uh, stories and journalism and articles about cybersecurity were all about the details and getting into the nuts and bolts, mm-hmm. kind of like we do on our on our segments. Mm-hmm. But you know, it, over the over time, over the last couple of years, it's kind of given way to sort of a pay to play, and you you hire journalists to tell your story, the whole buzzword bonanza thing, bingo. 
and uh, and I and I was I had been thinking about this anyway, and I just kind of at some point I said to him, I was like, "You're the you know you're one of the problems with the industry because you're a journalist, and all you do is, and maybe not him specifically, but I've met so many journalists because I I, I carry the the press media credentials that uh, they they." They think they're experts at cybersecurity, but all they do is all they know is what vendors tell them, right? Without the having been in the trenches and having lived through it, and and I and I was just kind of commenting that, you know, uh, and it's not to disparage anybody, uh, but they don't know because they haven't lived it when they're hearing stuff whether it makes sense or it doesn't, or if it's bullshit or not, or right. if it's just. There's totally a certain a badge of honor too, right? Like, you got to spend a a good forty eight to seventy two hours trying to get an exploit to work, right? Like Tyler, oh, right? You know, right? I, 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 that's a thing, right? You, I mean, a good number of hours, and you guys are just barely <laughs> scratching the surface. It's but to know, true. but to but you know, so there's, and and, and I'm not meaning to sound. Uh, you know, uh, egotistical or anything, but you know, I've, I've been around a long time. I've done a lot of things. I've been exposed to a lot of things and I certainly don't, you know, I couldn't sit down with you and, and Tyler and, 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 and make, make as, as quick a contribution to evaluating the vulnerabilities probably as, as others could. But, you know, so I had this casual conversation, this article shows up, uh, if you go look at it, it, it mentions George Takei. Takei? Takei. 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 Dude, you're uh, in the same article with George Takei. Opening. Like, that's yeah, awesome. The bottom I, line is I'm in the same article as Sulu. Right? And, 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 and really what's the, funny is a few years ago at DEF CON, I was at dinner and I met George Takei <laughs> in person and I, and I have a picture. And now Jeff has kind of crossed paths right. with and, George Takei as got well. The article. Yeah. I feel like we should have them on this show, right? Like, but if you weren't if you weren't already one degree separated, now you'd be two degrees separated. Uh, That's right. Also, <laughs> side note: George Takai is just an amazing human being. Mm -hmm. Like, he is just so awesome. Like, a, a person that really, truly cares about other people, uh, and is just super. Not, I mean, uh, also very gracious in that we kind of interrupted his dinner, but I was like. George, I'm, I'm like, I'm really excited to meet you. Like, if you if you would be so kind as to take a picture, he was like, absolutely, no problem. He was because a lot of times we meet people who we uh, admire mm -hmm. and people that are in the spotlight in celebrities, and quite frankly, a lot of them are like can be really douchebags. <clears throat> yeah, a complete. I mean, George is the nicest one. Yeah. The and, nicest and, and quite honestly, uh, I will. You, will you, we travel a lot. Yeah, you'll run into folks in the airport and a hotel, and it's yeah. like. That dude was on that show and that, that one time that did that, thing, uh, that, did the, that yeah. thing and I'm like, oh my god, he's awesome. And you know what? I won't say a goddamn thing. I won't take a picture over my shoulder because you know what? I don't want to be that guy. Right. And sometimes you can't help yourself and you got to be that guy. I know. I know. I know. Like, yeah. But to, but to, you know, so enough about me. Other than to say, we got we ought to try to get George Takai on the show. Sometime. Yeah, no, that'd, that'd be, be great. Cool. That'd be great. I, um, I, I had an article that talked about how forty two percent of IT security managers say their organization has been breached because of password compromise. I think Paul, you had an article about, um, one or two articles about passwords. So, you know. At the end of the day, you know, we talk about all this, uh, you know, highly technical stuff and what we need to do, you know, going through our segments tonight to, to secure Active Directory or not secure it and all this stuff we need to do to try to validate vulnerabilities and update and patch. It sounds easy, but at the end of the day, so many organizations are still falling to just the basics of passwords, which is why we drink. Uh-huh. Pretty much, pretty much. It's always passwords. It is. I mean, it usually comes down to some type of credential and or trust, right? And I think it's been that way from the beginning in computing, right? I mean, it's really always, almost always come down to exploiting some type of cross, trust or credential, right? I, I combined the word credential and trust and it came out crust. But... <laughs> <laughs> right, that trusted access. Right, we we've, we've need been to enjoying the drinks tonight. We need to validate that the person is who they are, uh, and authenticate them to the system. And the 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 way we exploit that 
has pretty much been like a variation on the same theme since we've had computers and networks, right? So, yep. le, so let yeah, me, I mean, correct so if I'm wrong. Me, I mean, you were there from the beginning of no, I mean it, the and, telegraph and, in 1914. And, but yeah, prior to <laughs> prior to computers, the <laughs> issue has always been authentication. I yeah. mean, in in um, in uh, World War II, the Japanese were taking advantage, and, and even the, the Germans, to some degree, were taking advantage of, you know, being able to speak English. Uh, in the Vietnam War in the '60s and, and running into the '70s, which is mm -hmm. you know kind of where I first remember, just a level set. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of the a lot of the Viet Cong, the communists. You know, North Viet Vietnamese had been educated in American schools or European schools, and they spoke fluent, in not only fluent English, but without any discernible accent. Uh, so they were very, uh, I, I brought up earlier, you know, the idea of airstrikes, but they would call in airstrikes and, and you know, the radio operators like, well, the guy's speaking English, surely he's not Vietnamese. Let's go ahead and drop the bombs on these coordinates. And they'd end up dropping bombs on, on American troops. Or, uh, and so my question that I want to ask you guys, because I've been pondering this for uh, about two weeks now, because uh, when I was on my way to RSA, I was standing in line at TSA, which is now a longer line than the regular line. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But there's this new thing called Clear. Yep. And and their 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 logo, their motto is "You are the best ID." Yes, sir. And. And I started thinking about that, and I said, okay, so what they're saying is in terms of something you have, something you are, something you know, they seem to be suggesting that uh, one form of single uh, – of the single form of authentication mm -hmm. is better than the other. Mm. And I'm open to entertain that, but, I, but I'm wondering about that. But they even also suggest that one form, and it's you know more the biometric form. Form, so it's something you have. It's, it's not only better than the password, something you know, but it's better than two-factor or multi-factor. It's really, it's really interesting that much. I mean, not to really try to get too philosophical, but like it, it all comes down to how do we what what goes into trust mm -hmm, mm -hmm. in communications in validation of who you are what what components what what pieces of information and how do we validate those go into what we call trust larry before the show was yeah. talking about in the the next book i started reading which is cyber spies yep. um talked about how there were zeppelins in world war 1 which is the the kind of first uh it, kind of stories that we have around Hacking, sort of, right? Yeah, uh, or yeah, yeah, hacking location based, right? Yep. Even at the time of of radio community before radio, or just as radio communications were coming, really into making its heyday. Be, yep. Like basically, the zeppelins were flying, and these were German zeppelins. Mm -hmm. And France said, "Well, if we can either intercept or influence these messages, we the can te read the telemetry data to the telemetry to help data because they, they were basically yep. saying like to the zeppelin." here's your course correction, here's where you should be flying, and, and France intercepted those uh, and modified them in some way, so the Zeppelin flew into airspace where France could basically take down those Zeppelins. I mean, arguably one of the first... It's, uh, G it's GPS spoofing. One of the first <laughs> in incarnations, right? right yeah. of, but the, the question of security is really around how, how do you trust those messages and communications that this message came from the... The, the the person that I trust that this message has not been modified in transit to Jeff's point if you, if how do I trust that when you show up to clear you are who you say you are right I mean it really right. all comes down and, to and, trust and, and, uh, I'm going to tangent two ways different here uh, first one if you uh, want to learn about the modern day GPS spoofing stuff yeah Larry uh, Mike Poor my, Larry, uh, myself and Mr Poor giving the keynote at Wild West Hacking Fest which now is now virtual, a virtual now virtual virtual conference. Um, on, uh, Which you know what it, I mean. That's really time, time travel and GPS fuckery. Wildwesthackingfest.com is that the same? So the same yep. website to register yep. for it. It's a virtual conference now. Yep. I, it, there's no reason why you shouldn't attend this conference right, virtually. Right, because it's now. free. It, it, you well, I mean, it's not free. It's virtual. You don't have to travel. You can do for, yeah, from your right, office. From your, I don't know what John is charging for tickets now I'm that not. it's virtual. But I suspect there's a cost to it, just to help recoup some of the losses about the cancellation of the physical space. But it now becomes no excuse because it's 
in, not limited in by tickets. Sense, we trust the people that are running this conference and presenting at Agreed. the conference, and we need to translate that trust to our audience, yeah. right? <laughs> yep. The other one is, do any of you guys have clear? I know Tyler, not an option, um, but... Wait, Jeff, why is it Jeff, not an option for Tyler? Don't Hold ask. On. Jeff, Paul? <laughs> tickets are 325 Have you been convicted you of a federal crime? Is that Does that disqualify you, Tyler? Is that... <laughs> I would love what? to know, actually. I'm on some list for some <laughs> things that don't let me do other things. Like, Global's denied me more times than I care to admit, so. Yeah. Okay. And But just to clear the record, you do not, you have not been convicted of a federal crime. No, no, no. Okay. No. Yeah, just clear, just. I don't want people to get that impression. But. Right, right. And <laughs> doesn't mean he not. hasn't committed crimes. Right. Right. Hasn't oh, yeah. No, 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 no. I would not vouch for that. Right. And now, <laughs> Jeff and Paul, you guys do not have clear. Uh, no, I have TSA pre. No. Okay. So, which is, I, I mean, I, a lot of people have TSA pre. And Whatever. I have clear. Okay. So enrollment is fairly easy. You go up uh, the first time and you basically prove who you are with an ID. Uh, and right. then they so say, clearly, Larry, you're better at evading detection from the feds than Tyler is. <laughs> <laughs> There's something about that, uh, but uh, uh-huh. it, didn't say, it didn't say who, fe- which feds. I did not. Um, I could but, speculate. But. Yes, you can. <laughs> um, but uh, uh, so I do have clear, uh, and you, you you're enroll and you provide some information. And the first time when you go there, you basically are finishing your enrollment. You prove who you are by something you have. It's my federal ID card, my license, my passport, you name it. And then you provide something that you are. Mm -hmm. So uh, they both took my fingerprints Mm -hmm. uh, and an iris scan. Mm, Interesting. So now... (laughs) Because the real real ID does not require any biometrics. No, no, it does not. It just requires documentation. I mean... well, it's Three? like it's a pre, it's a pre-authorization. It is. It is. You, so effectively, you've you get it ahead of time. Yeah, exactly. You get there to the line. The TSA pre-line has got six hundred people in it. Clear has no one. You walk up to Clear and you go, "Hi, great. Here's the station. Scan your boarding pass, fingerprints, or um, uh, retinal uh, scan. A retinal scan. Retinal yep. scan. Great. Thank you, sir. And then they take you to the front of the pre-line and they go, "He's already been vetted. Great. Go ahead." Mm-hmm. Done. So hmm. the real question becomes is this seems to be implemented and kind of we'll call it subsidized across all major airports kind of came out of nowhere. Mm-hmm. This is a major database that is again it's no different than any other database such as pre-global uh, passport administration like you're still providing the same kind yep. of info that can be hacked in the same way but what database, like who has access to this, who sponsors this database, who is now using this biometric data, has access to this biometric data, and now has accurate travel records that may or may not have had that through like interagency operability or different you know mechanisms that they, they may or may not have had. So really there's well, some interesting a- things about the clear database and who owns and, and uses that Agreed. data. And, and as soon as it gets well, compromised and we can start making those assumptions publicly, I will be happily – Happy to disclose that. Um, well, to, I'm, I mean, I'm all about question, using myself as a research subject. It, it's a commercial for-profit company, as Absolutely. near as I can it tell. Is. But I'm not trying to pick on them or any oh, other sure, sure, sure. Uh, uh, provider you know, solution that's out there. I'm asking the philosophical question, A, do any of us believe that one, any one form of the three forms of authentication that we're familiar with is inherently better than any of the other forms. No. No, I think no. it's the combination <laughs> of all of those pieces of data, and the more you have, the better, right? But those are all translated to something digital that all gets stored in the same the same database that can be either manipulated, modified, breached, or stolen. So, well, that's but, kind but, of my but wait, point, now, Tyler. But, uh, but does that translate to uh, government agencies, let's just say here in the U.S.? Are they actually sharing that data? So you mean to tell me when the NSA... Not deliberately, maybe. When the NSA <laughs> was collecting metadata about phone calls, that that was stored in a database mm-hmm. that was then shared with another agency that may have had other data about <laughs> you that they cor- correlated together? Mm-hmm. I mean... There's a lot of speculation there. There's also oh, yeah. the, well, there, the Snowden. There's a lot that, of speculation, but we're saying maybe it's a little bit harder to intercept and steal or, or somehow obtain 
you know, biometric data that's all, you know, that's ultimately digitized yeah. or the, the, the various methods of the, that's something that you are, something that you, something that you have, you know, which is a, you know, t- token historically or... it's a token, yeah. you know, that's providing you some sort of one-time key. All of these things have been exploitable. So we're all in agreement that there is, you know, while there might be a little bit higher level of, um, uh, effort that takes to exploit the you know the other forms they're all exploitable Mm -hmm. and so i think we all agree that two-factor authentication or we can call it multi-factor uh is the way to go or or is better than a single form of uh, of authentication regardless of what the single form is and that's where I like, you know, I, I, I was standing in line at TSA and I looked at the slogan, you are your best authentication or you are your best ID. And I'm like, wait a minute, that's single form authentication. That's something you are. They're suggesting, are they suggesting yep. that that is better than a password right. or, or better than right. a Be- token? Because, because I disagree with that. Be- because Jeff, we can't change that about you. Until we start talking about but CRISPR, there, but there's and, two different levels though. Like, yeah. there's validating that Larry is Larry, right? That's one right. level. Yeah. Not, but now, is Larry, in your case, a good guy or a bad guy? Right. That, somewhere, that's a different. Or that's a in different between. level. Or, or that's a different yeah. level. Of, there's no way to tell intent. Uh, right. right. And, that, and that's exactly the point. But and, and I think. And, but and, I and, think that know, I, could, I could be a good day when I enrolled, a good guy when I the day I enrolled. But I could be a bad guy tomorrow potentially potentially yeah. but well, likely even tsa is predicated on you're a frequent traveler you're a u.s citizen you're mm-hmm. a good guy you're not going to do anything bad i don't think anybody has exploited that yet but that right. doesn't mean that they couldn't your I mean, travel habits a bad made. guy yeah I, I you know i mean the you know for, the, for you know, going back to 9-11 mm-hmm. the people that were on the flights that did the whole 9-11 thing you know they 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 made themselves look enough normal within the system that they didn't raise any. Well, media but flags. so that but that led to uh, the Patriot Act, right? Yes. Yes. And then, yes, which is which is why NSA started collecting metadata. Of collecting metadata. Well, the very controversial part um, was that they were collecting metadata on phone calls. Yes. And so, if you had either sent or received a phone call from a known terrorist, then at one time when the Patriot Act was in effect, full effect, and Obama repealed some of that mm-hmm. and, and made them go through different different hoops to get that data. But it also turned out that these programs that were collecting metadata on all these phone calls, so if, let's say, Larry were to receive a phone call from a terrorist, right, yep. then they would be able to look at Larry's phone call list and see all the people that called yep. Larry. And, and that was second that, that And some, te- some terrorist butt dialed me and But said, that was second and, and, but that and, was second and, level. And, and right? they that I accidentally answered and I heard don't slap your wife in the face with your dick. It's, but it's, <laughs> that's really funny. That's an inside story. <laughs> inside joke. But so but the the NSA Actually, was could, on the outside because Hold was, on. Larry <laughs> receives a phone call from uh, a, a terrorist or, or the other way around. Uh-huh. NSA could then look at all the people that Larry either called or called Larry. Yeah. That was the kind of first level. The second level was I could look at all those, those people, people and see who called all of those yep. people. Two degrees so of it's separation. A, it's separation. It was a, a rare instance where they went that many levels deep. That program, uh, according to what has been published on these issues, again, it's all taken with a grain of salt, yep. speculation. But according to that, that did not uncover any, directly uncover any terrorist plots in the years that it was in effect mm-hmm. in the U.S. government. What they did say was that it did su- it did support some of the cases that got terrorists through other means, but did not directly support. Right. And the argument from NSA was, if we continue to collect this data, we will eventually find mm-hmm. someone. Yep. What uh, eventually came to fruition due to multiple pressures right like stuxnet being released and all this other sure. stuff what came to fruition was obama put together uh, a panel and said you need to analyze this and it led to legislation that said there was a much more levels of approval that the nsa had to go to the phone company with a lot more evidence and pull very specific Which cases, cases and yeah, not yeah. house all of that data themselves yeah. so it's I mean, a very different just... so jeff going back to your point it's very different to say larry's larry that's one level 
Now, is Larry a terrorist or not? Is a whole right. bunch of data mm -hmm. that needs to that could potentially be correlated. Yeah. Now we're just looking at what NSA is collecting, right? What about what all of the other agencies in the U.S. and outside the U.S. know about Larry and where? Yeah. It, is that data somehow being correlated? I, I'm not and, sure and, because and that why, requires a lot of interagency and, and why cooperation. Has, why has Larry flown to Iceland twice in the past six months? Mm -hmm. So I don't know, Paul, if we've worked out the schedule or not yet. I'm in studio next week. Hopefully yeah. we're doing part two of my story. Yes, I would and love we are, to do that. And job, we are, yes. we're going to touch on a lot of this uh, much more directly, what you're just citing. But I, I would say now, just keep in mind... Or, or, or please note that you know while you refer to what NSA was doing or wasn't doing, NSA very much follows the law. They're very adamant. No, I, about no, it. I agree. I agree, and, Jeff. And, it, yeah. and the and the issue is not whether, and this gets into the Snowden thing a little bit, whether there were NSA was running amok and and just violating the law. The issue was more what the Congress through legislative acts was allowing NSA to do. Correct. And while I think it's totally fair to debate and argue whether what our government was doing was uh, appropriate or not, it you know it, the the focus should not be on any of the ag specific agencies in particular NSA, it should be specifically on the Congress and what the Congress allowed. Starting with the Patriot Act cuz the Patriot Act the Patriot Act, in its most basic form, suspended habeas corpus, which is the uh, you know the principle of law that most of our Western you know legal system is built on, which basically you know habeas corpus. The literal translation is uh, you know is there a body? You mm -hmm. know is there evidence of right. a crime being committed? Right. And 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 the idea that uh, an an organization can can uh, approach a citizen and try to collect information, try to investigate them, do a search. Uh, you know, this is all constitutional stuff without uh, a probable cause, without evidence that there's been a crime committed, but just because of whatever reasons are. I mean, that to me is, I, I think, is the, is still the most significant um issue and something that I, I'm happy to debate with people, uh, you know, whether the Patriot Act was warranted or not, and whether the Patriot Act in suspending an habeas corpus, because, well, if they if they look like they're Middle Eastern or Muslim or whatever, mm -hmm. uh, you know, we, we automatically don't trust them, and so we're going to do a bunch of things. And that spills over into... Uh, you know, collecting information like you were describing on U.S. citizens and whether they had contact with known or suspected terrorists or terrorists that were on the watch list and so on and so forth. It's complicated. I will acknowledge that. Hey, that's a great I, point, Jeff. Yes. I, 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 I just, you know, my, I, I, I have to defend my former employer, NSA, simply because uh, in my experience, which hopefully we'll talk about next week, uh, they take the law very seriously, but they're but they're willing to do everything that they can within the law. Mm -hmm. But they but they do take the law seriously. So question the law, what Congress allows them to do, totally fair. Uh, and but, and Jeff, to you yeah. to your point, and I mm -hmm. I, I definitely uh, research both sides of the issue, speak to people on both sides of the issue. Jeff, having a background, having worked for NSA and other people that are very much privacy advocates, right? And I weigh all that together. I honestly believe, to Jeff's point, that it's very easy to simplify it and say the NSA is spying on everyone and violating everyone's privacy rights. And what Jeff just said was, it's a much more complicated issue, issue. than that, right? <clears throat> there are laws that are passed outside of the NSA that are passed, that are uh, put forth by presidents that are put forth through Congress, that uh, it, there's a exactly. lot of very complex mm -hmm. issues that are happening. You can't just have that kind of media-centric paranoia view that, oh my God, the NSA is spying on everyone and violating the rights mm -hmm. of all U.S. citizens. That's not, the, the NSA is there to help protect our freedom Domestic, and protect this yep. country, right? Yep. And it, they take that very, very seriously. And to place blame on any one agency or the other and say they're spying on people and violating rights, I think is, is truly unfair. You have to see both sides of it and realize, like Jeff well, said, it's a very complex issue. Yeah. 
I'll say one more thing, and hopefully this is in form of a teaser. If you're listening to this segment and you're planning on listening next week, and hopefully we're going to get a chance to record it, uh, do your homework. Google something called the church proceedings, because this goes all the way back to Watergate back mm-hmm. in 1972, where the you know the the break you know the the break in of the Democratic headquarters and in, in the Watergate a hotel in D.C. and all the fallout from that. I mean, very briefly, the church proceedings was the church was a Senate subcommittee formed uh, and and chaired by Senator Frank Church that was investigating the fact that. Uh, NSA, the FBI, CIA uh, uh, had a, ha- had and has a lot of capability to do a lot of nasty things. And one of the outcomes of the church proceedings, the, the, the Senate subcommittee investigation as a result of Watergate was to determine these organizations have a lot of power. They have a lot of capability. They have a lot of expertise and they don't really have a whole lot of legislative oversight. So the outcome, one of the outcomes of the church proceedings uh, as a result of Watergate was uh, something that is still a classified document, but but is, is um, generically referred to as the NSA charter. And it's something that I learned when I was there at, at NSA and something that I bumped into, which is the teaser, <laughs> tune in next week. But um, it, it basically the NSA, NSA charter says NSA can't do what NSA does to U.S. citizens. Hmm. Period. So, kind of around that, just from a a high level philosophical view, like one of the things I think is wrong with media and the public view of you know whatever agency we're going to play uh, advocate or or adversary against is the public wants the NSA or wants whoever to have the pre foresight to stop crimes to stop terrorist threats mm. to stop these things that are preconceived yet we are removing their ability to have the maximum amount of data to make a metric and weighted decision that you know well the patriot act may have been you know whatever it was those particular pieces of metadata that they were collecting, the more data they had, the more points of reference that allowed them to tear up to, you know, stage two collection that allowed them to weight different decisions and go after different people. Like either we we want to be protected and have this preconception uh, ability for people to step in before things happen, or we realize we need to be able to track them after things happen and then get them based on a privacy stance where they're not getting as much data up front. So you can't really have your cake and eat it too at this point from the standpoint of, of what we as the public are asking the NSA to do, asking the FBI to do internally, and then still keeping our keeping our, our level of privacy. Mm-hmm. Uh, to, to Jeff's point, it is, you know, they're doing the right thing in most cases unless it's a person or a group of people <laughs> abusing power. It's a very that's delicate balance. Thing. But very that's the balance. thing. Uh, but I truly believe in the U.S. There is, there is a balance, right? As much as we, there may be laws like the Patriot Act that go into effect, there's always people that are questioning those laws, and there's a process to maintain that balance of power. When we look at other countries, if you go back to Germany in, in the telegraphs, I mean, there was no balance of power. They were reading everyone's messages, right? And you go back to Russia during the Cold War. There was no privacy. They were reading everyone's communications, right? And in here in the U.S., we have that balance where we can have folks in various branches of the government making sure that the NSA is following the law, making sure that when we collect intelligence or, or have spy, and making sure that when, uh, if it does transgress into looking at what U.S. citizens are doing, that there's a balance, right? That there's a, another agency or government body that is having a level of approval, right? I think where the contention came in especially with the Snowden links, is the FISA courts, right? That they were just the kind of self-serving, like, just checking the box. Like, yeah, you can spy on whoever you were. But folks in the U.S. government noticed that, right? I mean, I think independent of Snowden, they noticed that. And they said, should we really allow this, right? And the laws did change over time. Whereas I feel like in other other countries, the, 
there are even not even any laws to pass to prevent that spying from happening on its own citizens. So to Tyler's point, but even, we but want, even we want the security, but there is a balance of power when it comes to privacy of citizens. And albeit not perfect, there is still some balance of power. But even with the FISA courts, um, I, I am not familiar with the FISA courts. I'm not a lawyer. I've never worked in that area. But if I extrapolate my experience with what, where I did work within the federal government, I still tend to think that there's a lot of overblown misconceptions yeah, sure. that, are, that, are, that are promulgated by the media, uh, you know, call it conspiracy theory or whatever. Um, but I, I, I still say it's complicated. There's more to it than that. And, and most of the, if not all the people that are working in these areas take their job very seriously. Mm. They, they are patriots. They are committed to what they were hired and took an oath to uphold. And, and, uh, I mean, I hang out with a lot of people that work at NSA and, and to a person uh, they believe that Snowden committed treason and, and because he did it during a time of active conflict, by definition, he, he warrants the death penalty. Um, do I hold that position? I will not say. But that is the common uh, uh, attitude that I know of the people that either still work at NSA that I communicate with or former NSA employees because of the damage that he inflicted in terms of the infrastructure that was put in place mm -hmm. to do the intelligence gathering and the information gathering, not to mention human lives. I mean, we're all pretty much sure that he uh, cost – not only the the uh, intelligence sources, but you know some of those intelligence sources were humans that no longer are walking on the earth, and 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 that's a a, a different level of discussion that we don't all often have when we're just. I'm. I often overhear the many conferences that I go to. You know the conspiracy theory. The oh, you know NSA is listening to everything. NSA is doing this. NSA is doing that. I'm like, well, to some degree, NSA wants you to think that because it's a certain level of disinformation. But mm. to another degree, they take it very seriously. And and you know the all I offer is my experience. I, I don't try to change people's minds. I just, I, I like to share and hopefully I will next week to some degree, yeah. you know, what my experience was that hopefully makes you just think differently or, or think more, uh, deliberately before you just, you know, cast dispersions at NSA or any government institution. I agree. I, yeah. I think we all need to be able to hear the facts as much as we can believe from both sides. Right, and, and, and make our own decisions. And, I, and, and, and I to just point, I think some some folks fall on you know on either side without understanding all uh, of the facts. And, and, and I think this in, in both sides of it. And I, and I think remembering our international audience, that I think this goes for any government agency that we're dealing with in any region that we may oh, be in. Absolutely. That, so what I love about the cyber spies book that I'm reading is it's very much focused on the UK. I mean, in, in history, right? Yeah. He calls it Britain, and I, 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 every time he says it with the, in the reader has an English accent. I think back to Monty Python and the Holy Grail <laughs> when they talk about we're Britons and the Britons. And the, I, just, I can't. I laugh uh, like inside like every time. Uh, Moises but, being lobbed in swords from it's yeah, no but it, but it's a for great a system of government. It it really put uh, kind of gives us that. Uh, global aspects, those in the U.S. that you know may partake on reading this 17-hour audiobook listening that I've just started. Nice. Uh, that, that gives that more global kind of perspective. Which so is, which you is great. you brought up Monty Python. Let me give you one little anecdote. When I was at NSA, and it was you know sort of the early days of the internet and, and computer networking, um, there was sort of an internal mailing list. You know, we were we were in the beginnings of Unix networking, and and um, there was a question that went out that somebody put out on you know a mailing list one time and gosh i don't even remember what the specific specific was but they asked you know should i do something and somebody responded well that depends are you talking european or, or african, african whatever it right, was right right yeah. You know, fully making a reference to Monty Python, but that person actually got in trouble with HR and got written up for a, a, an EEO, Equal Employment Oppor Opportunity oh. Violation, because of the 
you know, apparent, you know, reference to, you know, African versus European white black. That's how s- seriously and sometimes to a literal, you know, yeah. to a literal degree, NSA takes the law and, tr- and tries to be squeaky clean. Mm. So, Paul, I, I see uh, what story you're looking yeah, at. Yeah, I want to segue. That, after that one, I want to yeah. grab, grab one. I just want to segue uh, briefly. I'm a big fan of the TV sh- And this is like not even a segue. Like we're just changing gears. Uh, the TV show <laughs> Shark Tank. Uh, yep. Think and have your opinion about all of the sharks on that show, and there are many, and they change out. I greatly respect uh, all of the sharks uh, on that show because they've worked hard to get where they are. Sure. Right now, like them or not, I I really do like them and love them all in their own unique way. And uh, again, that kind of comes down to the respect I have for what they have achieved. Right, mm-hmm. and I uh, certainly play preference to. Um, you know, the Hershevex, uh, Hershevex in the group because he's in cybersecurity, right? I've never seen the show. Uh, so I very much love Mark Cuban because he's got that technology angle, uh, to it and has very much. And lived. his last name is Cuban. Well, and he's, <laughs> he, he does like cigars. <laughs> That's a great, uh, but it, it, ironically, Larry, he mm-hmm. does really, he likes cigars from what I've heard. Uh, and has had some kind of, uh, uh, delves into the cigar industry as well. Um, but very much I respect Mark Cuban because he got involved with technology, you know, like slept on his friend's couch and created his mm-hmm. first technology startup. So I greatly respect him for that. And some people don't like them for whatever reason. I, I think you just have to respect all of them. But Barbara Corcoran, I, I want to offer our, to her our advice. right? <laughs> like I, and so she basically her organization got fished. Um and there was a four hundred thousand dollar money transfer that happened as a result of a phishing oh. email. Now, what was interesting is that Barbara is quoted in this article as saying, "I was upset at first, but then remembered it was only money. It was only money in the sum of four hundred thousand yep. dollars." My advice to Barbara Corcoran, who I, I, again I respect her mm-hmm. and I like her. Uh, uh, on the show is you know I don't know her personally but I like her yep. her persona on the show as she uh, is on the show and I've watched but I really this is a cybersecurity problem as much as we use the term cyber right but my advice is this is a process problem absolutely right absolutely. there needs to be checks and balances mm-hmm. when money is exchanging okay. hands this problem was not training her employees how to spot a phishing email. No. This problem is creating processes that say anytime we transfer money, money. there needs to be certain checks and balances, balances in place mm-hmm. that require a human to val- – again, it goes back to trust – to validate uh, that trust relationship yep. between the requester of that uh, yep. transfer is, of money. Is, it, is this a valid invoice? Is this in our system? Is this generated from a vendor that right. we have a certain level of trust with that we've provided some vetting for? Very if well this vendor is a Absolutely. 100% trust, then yeah, issue it. Right. And with, so from a- with over this dollar amount, we need to have a second sign- signatory authority. Yep. Uh, if it is a vendor that is a 10% trust level, then we need to go through these other hoops. Like there's, but what there's, I love there's, there's an amount of work that needs to happen. And what beforehand. I love about what you said is over a certain amount, there's all their level. So there needs to be a fax. There yes. needs to be an email. There needs to be a phone call. There needs to be the higher the amount, the higher level of validation of that trust yes. you have with that transfer. And that d- solves this and, problem. This and isn't about depend, like, depending on the person that you're paying. So like if it's Joe's cleaning service. Yes. That you typically pay five hundred dollars a a week to, and now all of a sudden it's ten thousand dollars. Absolutely, the, the, there's some difference there. This it, isn't a problem. If it's like, Cisco, you're paying a million dollars to a quarter. While we'd love, you we, know, we, we many to would love to to go to Barbara and say, "Hey, if you buy this product, we can make this problem go away." <laughs> that's not that's <laughs> no, not our, right. That's not our stance. Right. <laughs> no. Our stance is implement a process mm-hmm. that makes it really near impossible for someone to pull off this style of attack because your process is validating the trust of no. someone who is making and, a and request I can, to and transfer money. And I can tell you, we don't want you to buy a product to make this happen. We want you to consult with this so that we can tell you yeah. how we have seen other pro- folks 
solve right. this problem. Because while well, Barbara can say, well, you know, I was upset, but, you know, it's only money. If $400,000 is everything that you have in the bank, sure, it's air quotes only money, mm -hmm. but that's that's your net net worth that just went out the door that you'll never recoup from. I, it I, is process I, and diligence <laughs> to make sure that it doesn't happen. Tyler. Yeah, so from a business standpoint, like in, in my opinion, there there should never be a monetary loss from a phishing scam. Yeah, this is a hundred percent a process. There's not a technology. This is not with inside of users' grasp. There should always be, and we've only ever solved this problem from a, a monetary standpoint via policies and processes. From an individual standpoint, now this comes back to something that I seen a good a good friend of ours in. I think it made the news. There's a GoFundMe, uh, a family, a nurse. They just bought a new house, and they were in the process of closing, and they got an escrow email saying, "Hey, you know, you have to transfer the seven hundred thousand dollars." Oh, that your happens house a lot now, Tyler. Escrow. Yeah, seven hundred thousand to an individual that is not federally insured, that's not covered. Basically, his family's lost lost their entire life savings, and now they're homeless essentially because of a process not being in place. This is a process that you know they they're not going to have in place as an individual. This is should fall to the fault of uh, I'm I'm going to go with the title company or ESCO company being Agreed. being owned and getting pre pre knowledge and should be held liable, but they're not. So, uh, as a business, you should have process and you. should you know, there's no reason that you should be losing money this way. As an individual, this is where the vigilance and diligence and uh, awareness training actually pays off. There's not any number of awareness things you're going to do from a corporate standpoint to stop uh, business from happening and money transactions from going down the pipe. So you mm -hmm. need to make sure there's policy and process in place. Agreed. Yeah. Agreed. Larry? Yeah, I, I, we don't need to necessarily touch on any specific one of my stories, but you can tell what mode I'm in over the next couple of weeks uh, based on my <laughs> stories for news articles. Uh, three out of my four news articles that you may need to do a refresh on the wiki for um, are all wireless related. Can you tell... Go figure. Can you tell an mm. update to 617 is coming? Mm -hmm. Uh-huh. And three of those... Uh, one of them uh, is uh, the Wi-Fi crook attack. What uh, is that now? Is that a new Wi-Fi attack? Yeah, it's a it's a new weird Wi-Fi wi attack based on uh, some of the language around crack, which uh, yep. Matthew Van Oof uh, uh, released uh, and team released mm -hmm. uh, not that long ago. Uh, Crook, however, is a really interesting one, very similar types of things about key reuse, mm -hmm. uh, which crack was. So effectively with Crook, it is, let, I'll, I'll draw the scenario. Hey, I've got data. I need to send it. Here's my key, encrypt the data, send it. Hey, I've got data. Here's my key, encrypt it, send it. Dauth. Oh, disconnect from the network. I don't need those keys anymore. White memory of those keys. But I still have this data that I need to send that was spooled. So grab keys, encrypt it, and send it. Mm. That data that is now being <laughs> sent on the after the dauth is... I'm going to use keys that were in memory that were wiped that I no longer needed. So default keys of all zeros. So it doesn't <laughs> reuse the previous keys because they're wiped. Because they're wiped. They're gone. Uh, like, hey, encryption, 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 encryption with unknown keys, unknown keys, deauth. I don't need those keys anymore. Wipe them. But I've got this buffer of data that still needs to be sent. Send that data with the keys that are in this location in memory. Oh, those keys got wiped. That's cool. It's all zeros. Great. We'll just send that data out. Implementation errors, Jeff, <laughs> right? In, yes. in encryption. It's not the algorithm, it's the implementation. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Eval. Yeah. <laughs> doesn't, doesn't surprise me. <laughs> Failure in eval statements right there, I'm telling you. So so here's my question. I mean, remember back, you know, when Wi-Fi was first coming about? I back, do. Gosh, 20 years ago. I, I do. And well, all do the security vividly. professionals says, don't use Wi-Fi. Stay on the wired. And now Wi-Fi is pretty much everywhere, everywhere. and we rely on it. Yeah. Um, no, we and, don't. We don't know, rely on it. We depend on it. And what? And yeah. what do we? What do we talk about now? It's the cloud. Don't go to the cloud. Don't go to the cloud. And yet, you know, sooner or later, we're gonna end. Up, everything's gonna end up in the cloud. My question is, you know, using the Wi-Fi as an example, uh, is it generally more secure, and we should be feeling comfortable? using it knowing that there's people out there that are still doing the res research that will uncover things like what larry's just talking about and these are one-offs or 
uh, not that we're going to turn the clock backwards, or should we just, how should we be appropriately paranoid when we're using all this cool technology that promises security and yet time and time again is proven uh, to have consistent problems? Wow. That's deep, that's a Jeff. that's a continual testing. Uh, continual is that testing. too deep? <laughs> it's it's not deep, and I could I I think I can sum that up in a couple of words. And it's and I'm going to sum it up in a couple of words, knowing that I'm probably going to be wrong. But if you had to go use Wi-Fi, yeah, you can use Wi-Fi securely. If you're using pre-shared key, greater than twenty characters on your pre-shared key. Uh, if you're using enterprise configure your clients appropriately and if you're using wpa3 wait <laughs> don't mm. do that shit yet uh wait till it's proven wait wait till it's <laughs> a little bit more proven uh i but configure your stuff securely for what's available uh, uh, absolutely yeah. and and to one of those one of the new features of wpa3 one of my next stories is uh owe or opportunistic wireless encryption the point is here is you can stand up a guest network, an open wireless network mm -hmm. that we've come to know and love, and you can do encryption. No love is attackers. I mean, there's a, no, you, a great no, distinction no, well, between no open one, networks and, and well, encrypted an, networks, a, a, right? An open network uh, as an attacker and no one love as an attacker and as a consumer. Yeah. Like, think about... I don't have to go find... What's your Wi-Fi password a, again? Exactly. Yeah. You know, like, like, I can be in... Starbucks. Am I, oh, I need Wi-Fi. Oh, free Wi-Fi. I can be in Stop and Shop here locally. I, oh, free Wi-Fi because cellular service sucks there. Like, mm -hmm. there's open wireless networks everywhere for guest-style mm -hmm. networks. The intent with OWE is to provide encryption for open wireless networks. I like where this is going. Well, actually. So, yeah. hey, uh, I'm at Stop and Shop, and I need to talk to my wife about grocery list. Sell your service sucks. I'll just join the Stop and Shop wireless network. I don't want it to be open, but there's this new WPA3 OWE standard, Open uh, um, Opportunist Wireless Encryption, where we exchange like Diffie Hellman keys, mm -hmm. and I can do encrypted traffic on an open wireless network with That's no pre authentication, awesome, no yeah. uh, EAP types, and any of this crap. The problem is e e usability versus security. Yeah, but the the problem is is that on OWE networks, you go into Stop and Shop, and there's a network called Stop and Shop, and you look at it, and it's got the little lock icon that says it's OWE. Mm -hmm. What's preventing me as an attacker from creating a network that, that says yeah. Stop and Shop with the little lock icon that's OWE? It's back to our trust issue. That's exactly. Been a, a theme there's of the show. no yeah. methodology in OWE to prove that that network is the right network. Right. And how do you do that? Right. You can't. You yeah. can't. You can't. You can't. So you trust whoever's internet you're using. Exactly. And you have to go to Stop and Shop headquarters and have like a, a PGP key signing party, <sighs> right? At Science. <laughs> no, 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 so no, no, no. When I go to any it. Stop and Shop, no, 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 does that. no, no we do not go to, do that. we do not go to Stop and Shop headquarters. We go to your wedding. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> wow. We're throwing the so old school jokes that's back. old school <laughs> joke. <laughs> so, so Larry, now I Larry's. Well, hold on, Jeff. The joke was, now Sorry. I pronounce you the twisted pair. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> twisted you are. Ooh, I get Wait. that. Um, <laughs> yes, Jeff. So my other philosophical question is, uh, you know, back in the early days, mm -hmm. we used to talk about how, uh, you know, as new versions of operating systems and applications came out, we, we used to advise well, you don't want to be on the latest and greatest because that's going to be the buggiest and that's where the vulnerabilities are going to be. You should always be one, you know, at least one version back. Mm. And yet, hey, it's been how many? It's been, it's we're been a three long and a half time. hours into it. Before I mentioned PCI, which, and PCI demands you to keep current and keep, you know, keep current, keep Editing. up to date, patch everything. And we've said it how many times this evening? Patch everything, keep everything current. Mm -hmm. And yet the paradigm in the early days was, don't get on current. Uh, where where are we today? Should we should we always stay oh, one Jesus. off, or do or do we need to jump ahead? To yes. I'm just I'm just translating that to like our Jeff drinking right. I, that's really <laughs> deep because He's I'm really bullet, bullet ride. Fashion bullet but ride. I, I'm translating bullet that ride. to like our Apache Tomcat version, right? Like, right. Yeah. If you're on an older version, like you're really screwed. But if you're in a newer version, does that really you're just really screwed? 
does that open you up to like a false sense of security and newer attacks that maybe haven't been disclosed that are maybe used by elite attackers, by nation states, right? You think you're secure because you're on the latest version, but really you're running the, like you said, Jeff, the latest buggy code that does have vulnerabilities that really only the kind of forward thinking groups are looking at and maybe have exploits for. Uh, on, on the Wi-Fi side, there's ways to securely use WPA2, the older stuff. There's ways to securely use the newer stuff, but uh, arguably the newer stuff has had so little right. investigation <coughs> in, the, in the public space that <coughs> we don't know. <coughs> exactly. There's some issues. Clearly, we're finding well, some issues. <coughs> and excuse me. I don't know. I, I, and, I, I, and I, I, I look at the track record of the folks that provi uh, um, proposed and ratified ratified WPA3 with the Wi-Fi Alliance in that the Wi-Fi Alliance has proposed numerous security standards for Wi-Fi in the past, and they're absolute shit. Yeah. So I, I will give you an example. Wi-Fi protected setup. Oh. That is a Wi-Fi Alliance standard, which was also the same group that said, hey, WPA3, it's a thing. And I, I, I've talked about this in the past in the show. The Wi-Fi Usability, Alliance. Usability, man. The, yeah, <laughs> protection and usability. We want everybody to adopt this, so make it usable, but it's got to be secure, mm. and they don't do lots of vetting. So yeah, they really screwed that up. The, the, the big deal that I see with WPA3 is that they've got lots of opportunity to make WPA3 this amazing thing. But they only require one limited piece to get the WPA3 stamp, and that's mm -hmm. OWE. Right. Which we just talked about that OWE is potentially vulnerable in, in certain in, in, in installations. Jeff, back so to your two, point. So back two, to your so point. Two, Hold points. on, Jeff. Back to your point. Go ahead. Conficker A, right? One of the first instances <coughs> of Conficker. When Excuse the me. security folks analyzed that, and looked at the encryption algorithm being used, they figured out that it was one of the guys in RSA. One of the, because their RSA is an acronym for the three people, right? Those are the initials of the Revest, Shamir, and somebody's going to yell at I, I always get it wrong. It's the, it's the initials of the three inventors. Yeah, so I, I think it was Revest. Uh, Revest had proposed a new encryption algorithm. And done that for kind of very quietly. It was on a website at the university. It was a proposed standard under review. Configure A implemented that standard, right? One would think, to your point, that if you're implementing the new stuff, you're really secure. And the analysts that were looking at Configure were really kind of jazzed that, like, um, well, first shocked. And then that they were using this algorithm, like they had figured out, attackers had figured out that like there was this encryption algorithm, they're the only ones using it. And then they found a vulnerability in it. And they were really excited that they could exploit this vulnerability to, at that time, take over the world's largest botnet that was Configure A. And they actually went to three letter government agencies and like, hey, can you help us like decrypt this? And there's this vulnerability in it. And government agencies were like, yeah, no. And again, that goes back to uh, the secrets are not what you derive from uh, the exploitation of however you're getting those secrets. The secret is the, the how, right? And so government agencies are like, no, we're not going to decrypt that for you. And then they saw Configure B. And they're like, that's interesting. What do they do with the encryption algorithm? Well, it turns out, uh, if it was revest, and I apologize if it wasn't, had realized that there was a vulnerability in his original proposal mm -hmm. and had submitted a second proposal that fixed the vulnerability. But the Conficker authors also saw that and implemented the fix, fix and the second revision for that encryption protocol. So mm -hmm. to your point, Jeff, I don't know that implementing things new is like the magic pixie does that makes everything secure. 
Right. So, so two points. Uh, uh, you know, Larry was talking about you know Wi-Fi, going to Starbucks and getting it for free, uh, the convenience, the speed, mm-hmm. you know, the the usability. Those are all significant factors when you consider that we're not really in the security business; we're in the risk business, and and risk is uh, primarily based on the economics, the cost. So, you know, how do you factor in free versus how much you have to spend to do all these different things to be you know, secure, a little bit more secure, secu- more secure than most. Um, the, the other thought is that I, 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 I think that there's a, there's certainly a, an attitude, uh, or a belief within our, within our world, if not our industry, that technology will solve the problem. Technology will, uh, you know, all these vulnerabilities and risks and threats that we uncover get solved by the newest and the latest technology. You know, let's just go to the cloud because it's secure and so on and so forth. The reality that I think uh, I see and, and I, I, I think I'm right and, and I don't think I can be proven wrong is that we are in this continuous process of you know the new might be better and it might fix one or more security holes that we're aware of but invariably it opens up new new holes we just may not have discovered them yet yes so what's better than wpa3 wpa4 right hasn't even been developed yet but it's better, and it'll it, be more secure it really than all the things that we'll figure out is is wrong with WPA three. And, and we so probably we... and we probably won't call it WPA three. We'll probably call it uh, Wi Fi Security seven or something like that. Yeah, well, you know, we have to brand it and market it, so right? We because can we, sell we don't we don't but... have we don't have eight hundred two eleven A B G N A A C. And it's no longer A X. And it's no longer A X. It's Wi Fi six. Right. Like what happened right. to Wi-Fi five? Well, what happened to IPv four? Right. What happened to IPv six? Five. <laughs> and was there a five? No. Yeah. Oh, wait. So uh, you know, know, you know, my my curmudgeonly old timer observation, having and 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 this is true, this was true before the age of the computer and the internet and networking and cloud and all this stuff. But it's always been this sort of cat and mouse game. Uh, you know, new technology is developed and then the bad guys figure out ways to break it. And so you have to continually evolve. And I, I don't think we're ever going to get away from that. I'm happy to be proven wrong, but I think all of us that are in the security industry, we ought to recognize that uh, nothing that we talk about in terms of solutions are really ultimate solutions. <laughs> they might be a stopgap at best, but just wait. Something else, somebody is going to do, and, I, and I'm thankful for all the researchers and hackers that are out there that keep poking holes in these things, because mm-hmm. that's how we keep evolving. That's how we keep moving forward. Evolving might be a generous word. Um, did you guys see the story on uh, a rootkit in the cloud? Mm-mm. They breached. No, I, I, not until you posted it, but it looks very intriguing. So, apparently, this malware is... From what I can tell from this article, and I haven't looked into it uh, much deeper than just reading this article, what I glean is that malware is aware that it's installed in an AWS environment. When it is, it attempts to modify the security group that it's in, in AWS, and allow for services either in or out. The article doesn't really kind of specify so that it can communicate. In other words, if it lands in an EC2 instance, right, and figures out that it either can't get out or stuff can't get in, it attempts to modify the security group. Uh, In AWS, your security group is essentially your firewall, right? Modifies the security group to add rules that allow communications in or out. I thought that was really cool in terms of all the stuff I saw this week that was like basically like same shit, different day. This stuff was actually really cool that the malware that could end up on your servers could be aware of what cloud provider that it's in and attempt to basically exploit trust that your cloud provider has with the services and or systems that you're running to be able to basically open up firewall rules by default. 
kind of like almost like universal plug and play, but but not in effect that malware is not just interacting with the system, but the cloud provider that it's in. That's kind of scary yeah. to me. That is pretty scary, but this isn't this isn't like from a technological standpoint, this isn't a huge leap and this isn't something that no. we haven't seen before. I don't know if I go as far as calling this a rootkit, right? Like that's a stretch. This is really cool. Definitely not a rootkit. But you're talking about AWS like CLI, right? You land on the box, there are certain outer effects. We can tell if we're in a virtual environment. We can yeah. we're already malware's already doing all these things to evade sandboxes to kind of pinpoint these. But then adding the kind of AWS CLI or uh, Azure via like PowerShell and and the Azure plugin piece, like that's kind of novel and, and a unique way to get XFill and, and start a communication channel. But again, this is someone else's hardware server and network. So nothing we haven't dealt with and or seen before, but the fact that they've moved to the cloud, like that just means we kind of have to adapt and and uh, evaluate what we're what we're considering our security boundaries and our risk as far as where we're putting our our kind of uh, boundaries with inside of the cloud as well. I think there's a an, an audience challenged me on this, but a small percentage of folks in organizations that if a security group rule changes, you get some kind of alert on that. <laughs> like lock it, logging that and integrating that into your security operations, in my opinion, right now is like, is super hard, right? That means you'd have, you'd have to know what AWS log and service, how to put that in there, what permissions, and then have that sent to a central SIM on-prem that then alerted, like... Uh, like, is that even Cloud Trail? That. Like, can Cloud Trail tell me when a... Security group rule. Cha- I I don't know the answer Actually, to that question. Yeah. I mean, there might there probably uh, there there are people that know the answer to that question. Uh, my thing that I I, I want to evangelize to our audience is it's a very small percentage of people that are that know that that can happen and know that where to log it and then know how to operationalize that. Is my point? Would you agree with that, Tyler, Jeff, John, like like Larry? I, don't like, I agree, I but that very but from a from a national security perspective, that's kind of stuff that we like worried about. You know, the the mm-hmm. idea that well, there's not that many people that know about it and can exploit. Right. Well, I mean, either, maybe that's either either legitimate in the com- commercial context. But but, uh, but there's two sides to that, Jeff. Right, the yep. uh, 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 threat actors that can exploit that versus the defenders that can actually pick up on that. Right, and and that's my concern. I, I want to raise the bar of people who can detect that, right, to combat the threat actors. And I, th- I think that's a really great, really great point that I think we're in a significant disadvantage when malware runs around like this that is interacting with our systems in that way. What's our ability to detect and respond to these threats? I think the response is uh, organizations that can respond to this is pretty low. Threat actors, uh, kind of a theme that I've noticed in our conversations on this show, threat actors have the advantage in that their knowledge of what they need to know in order to effectively exploit infrastructure is smaller than the amount of knowledge you need to know to be able to detect and effectively respond to the threats. And, and or, or, just, or just build something production, right? Just to build, not even, not right. even secure or protect that, that building piece. But this is a good indicator of... You know, as as we start to see these things, if malware is already there and we're already seeing this in the wild, that means that that we are behind the curve yep. per the usual. Uh, but that means we also have got to start like now looking at this and and educating and spreading that message because as soon as you see it in the wild, as soon as you see it in the public, that means this has already been used and this is potentially already something that you're going to have to go and do. Maybe not necessarily incident response, but you're going to have to go and. And audit those particular security group rules. Make sure you know what's running in your cloud. Know what has been changed effectively. And you may not even have the ability to do that or have the logs because there's not documentation because cloud is hard. It's new. There's not a lot of people that know it. Like just like we talked with Sean. Like this is right. all. See what what I hear you saying though, topic. Tyler, is that once we read about this in like the popular news, 
that nation states have been doing this for a long time. I'm going totally conspiracy theorist, right? Nation states have been doing this for a long time, and basically they're, they've already done this effectively and we're once it already make, screwed. Once it makes it to the news, it's too fucking late. It's too late. Well, look at look at DDWRT. Like, you guys know that inside and out, and, like, we we know now that there were documents that were leaked, but prior to those, there were there were malware and and rootkits and and worms that were leveraging DDWRT vulnerabilities mm-hmm. to effectively modify firewall rules to use those for you know changing the security security groups or the routes uh, yep. to pass traffic through. So you know again sure. this is nothing new. It's just a different piece of hardware in a different era. Yep, and and then there was the move to use DDWRT on consumer devices. <laughs> So now we have IoT, so we got all these botnets too. So yeah, you know, it's like nothing new. Nope. Just different device. Just, well, same old story, different device, different software. Yeah. So now 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 you gotta be aware of your cloud, which obviously, you know, you should have been to begin with, but this is uh, this is starting to evangelize and you know, if you're an organization and you're listening and you're concerned about your security and you're really trying to do things that matter. Pay for your people to get some freaking training around this cloud. Don't expect them to learn mm. all this on their own on the weekend. Give them some training. Give them some time. Give them some budget. Don't make them do their regular 40-hour week and still learn all the stuff that you're expecting them to learn as they're migrating and being thrown into the fire. Like This is why, uh, as defenders, you always end up behind because you know it's, it's hard as attackers. We're learning all these different systems and, and having to pay for this training too. But from a defense standpoint, you're doing all of that and doing it on your own budget and not being paid or, you know, given the time off to do this. So pay your people better, train them, give them the appropriate resources to do what they have to do. It's, but, you know, Tyler, that's a really interesting point in kind of how the deck is stacked, right, between attackers and defenders. Attackers can afford to spend an entire week on learning some new offensive techniques that allow them to compromise cloud infrastructure, Right. And I don't have to worry as an attacker about operationalizing it, about all this other stuff. I just need to get from zero to I can exploit stuff in the cloud. As a defender, I need to know a whole ton more stuff about how to operationalize my cloud infrastructure, coupled with the the problem that you just very articulately described, which is... I have to do my day job of maintaining the shit that I'm maintaining now, which could be a mix of on-premise and cloud. And by the way, learn about these new techniques for building and securing cloud infrastructure, which I don't have time for. And that's where I think the deck is stacked towards the attackers, not the defenders. And it's, it's one of my greatest concerns right now. When we talk about all this new technology of cloud and, you know, as Jeff will probably term it like the hipster stuff of you know, Docker and AppSec and cloud and all this stuff, right? The deck is stacked in the attacker's favor, not necessarily the defenders. And that's a great concern of mine. I mean, they, they have to build. You have executives that are, hey, I've seen this in the airport. We're rolling to 0365. And by the way, like, you know, I'm going to be a pilot group and we're migrating next week. So get going on that. So now you're learning. You're still putting out the fires. You're still having to build. Yeah, as attackers, we have to know we probably know most of the systems across all of the orgs. We know a ton of systems, a ton of technology. We know them better than, than most of defense because we have to learn all those. But we don't have to learn necessarily how to build those for production. We have to know the ins and outs of the technology, and we have to be able to identify and find the caveats that allow us to break them. That doesn't yes. mean we have to operationalize, stand those up, deal with politics with inside of an organization – all well migrating and doing this with live data that may or may not cost a company millions of dollars mm-hmm. uh, and you know hey do that in your 40 hour a week yep. and and we and you know Tyler as attackers we can stand that up in about 300 different configurations in an afternoon right and understand all the ways and it could be implemented and the ways in which you've chosen to do it we give us an attack math right yep all right, maybe you not. An, maybe not an af- Maybe not an afternoon. Maybe it takes us a week. But you've got a week to do it. And now it's permanent in your organization. Now, I, I changing topics. I I I love and I, I made a tweet this week that really kind of showed not just that Wait. I love hacker movies. That all of us in the security community love hacker movies because when I made a post about hacker movies, like the response was ridiculous. And 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 I love everyone who read that and and responded to it. Right. And I have these like very vivid thoughts sometimes 
when I read articles that we're going to cover on the show that say, mm. these are the first passwords hackers will try when attacking your device. And like <laughs> my mind goes right to the plague when he's going through the passwords, right? And he gets to sex and he's taking the pencil and like pushing it through his fingers. <laughs> like he's like sex, like love and in secret and God, right? And it, when he says the sex, he's pushing the pencil through. And I'm like, you know what? If we're at a meeting with executives and we do that, like, we're fired instantly. Like, that's totally Hollywood. But when I read the article, it says, the five first passwords that hackers will try when you're attacking your device. I'm like, God, love, sex, and secret. Like, there's there's four wow. right there. Like I thought it was golf and money in there. The fifth one might be password or one, two, three, four, five. But... It turns out when I read this article that God, love, sex, and secret were like weren't even on the list, and I was disappointed. Because <laughs> I really thought, like, if you watch Hackers, that those are the most chosen passwords. But it turns out that's just Hollywood, and not, and not. What's really funny though is if, which is why War Games was a much better hacker movie because it really displayed the methodology of the time mm -hmm. it's, much it's more it. realistically it's than. I hackers. mean, the password in that case was pencil. Uh, at oh, least no, in, in, in that, or in, Joshua, no. or Joshua, in, in Joshua, Joshua, in, in that in, well, incarnation, right? Mm -hmm. Which, which uh, okay, I agree. In terms of passwords, definitely makes more sense. But mm -hmm. what's a trip for me is when I watch top three hacker movies of all time. Which you put them in, you put them in any order you want. It's sneakers, it's hackers, and it's war games, right? Mm -hmm. Go yes, back yes. and watch that. Those of us listening and hosts on the show that have children that are hackers, right, that are influenced by us and have that hacker gene, and you watch those three movies, it's a total trip for me. Like, I was watching Hackers with my kids, and I was like, watch, like, when they cut to who hacked into all this stuff, I'm like, it's going to be a kid about your age, right? Mm -hmm. And then they cut to Dade, and he's like, the camera has to come down, right? And then I'm like, watch when he's on the plane. He's going to New York. I'm like, cue really cool hacker music. And then when he's playing the video game, I'm like, watch. He's going to beat her. And I'm like, wait. Cue really cool hacker music. music. And rather than my kids are just looking at me like, dad, like, how many times have you watched this movie? Like, you're a real <laughs> nerd, aren't you? Right? So I agree with you that those are the three, the top three hacker movies, but they do three different things in oh, terms agreed, of Jeff. Yes. where we are today. Oh. War Games introduced the methodology. Yep. Uh, sneakers introduced the the idea of hey hacking hacking for hire, including social engineering. Sure. And hackers more than anything, I uh, introduced the idea of that there's a hacker culture or subculture. Undergr underground to me subculture. Yeah. yeah. To me. Yeah. Uh, this is this is really ridiculous. And, and wait, 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 wait. But hold on. To wait, me, no, no, hold on. And Swordfish <laughs> introduced that you could get blowjobs while hacking. Agreed. That was probably a shining moment. That's when but hacking became cool. To That's me, when hack naked became a thing. To me, like you, you, war games and sneakers were completely instrumental in so many ways in a more serious kind of aspect. When I watch hackers, like especially with my kids, it's really about style. Jeff, right? I think it's kind of what mm -hmm. you were articulating, yeah. right? It's the soundtrack. It's the set design. It's the, it's the costume design. It's the it's costume design. It's certainly the not, It's certainly not the screenplay, and it's certainly not the acting, right? It's not mm. winning any Academy yep. Awards. But if you take the soundtrack, the set design, and the style of that movie, that's what really you kind of what? Put, it, it puts it in that may, aspect, may, right? I think that's one of the things maybe we're missing now is that there's no style in hacking anymore. Like hackers really they're embody stickers. that that whole like style, but they, also they, but there's no but suit also, jackets. But also and there's no hood. What was hoodies. interesting in hackers is uh, when they said certain lines, I could turn to my children and say, when Joey comes up and is like, dude, 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 like I need a hacker handle, and he, you know, uh, Ma uh, Ma Doctor Doom. Masters, you know, deception. Mm -hmm. I'm like, I can turn to my kids and be like, dude, those were real hacker handles of the time. Those were hacker handles tied mm -hmm. to real people at the time. Their minds are like blown. They're like, yep. holy crap, how do you know that, dad? I'm like, because I'm a nerd <laughs> with way too much time on my yep. hands, son. And Lord, Lord, Ni killers, Lord Nikon. Mine. And Lord, but when serial killers in class, and he's like, oh, you mean Emmanuel Goldstein is not is not in this class? And I'm like, 
kids like Emmanuel Goldstein like started 2600 like he mm-hmm. was a hacker in the scene at the time like they did their homework and they made this movie like just see their reactions is totally cool hackers is more about style in and, my opinion and, and, for it, the, and, again, and for the record you and I both know Lady Nikon oh yeah was that what that character was based on no no yep. no hey speaking of having nothing but time yes we are almost at 10 we are out of time Woo. I thought it was a great segue. I got arcade machines to fix too. Hacker movie kind of things. Uh, I do want to well, thank we'll everyone who on and on. everyone who participated <laughs> in that Twitter thread. Thank you so much. There were a lot of suggestions. There was two German hacker movies. Who am I? And twenty three were the two movies Ooh. that came up. I believe they were both German films that I have not yet been able to find very easily. Uh, but are on my list to seek out, mm-hmm. uh, to watch. Um, so when you make, you know, kind of like a, a tweet like that and kind of ask a question about hacker movies, one of the things was that kind of unintentional consequence of getting people's opinions on what are hacker movies mm-hmm. and learning about what you haven't heard about. So uh, thank you all for that, and I would definitely be... Well, there's also, uh, and and I, I'm not going to remember the name of it off the top of my head, but uh, when I was at one of my talks, when I was talking about uh, Cliff Stahl and the Cuckoo's Egg, yeah. I was approached by somebody that was from Germany that said, you know, the Germans put out a, a movie that was based on the hackers that Cliff Stahl was tracking down. So it's yeah. sort of it's sort of their side of the story. The name escapes me right now. But that's and I haven't seen it yet because it's very obscure. But I, I think somewhere I've got a link to it. Uh, it's on my watch list. But, yeah. You know, it, it, yeah, it, it, it paints a it. different picture of what was going on there. So but here begs the question as we round up the show. If your top three are uh sneakers, war games, and hackers mm-hmm. What are your other two, Larry? Oof. Okay, while you think about that, Tyler? Oof. Swordfish. I was, yeah, Swordfish. And, hmm. and... And I don't know if it's a hacker movie. I, w- I would actually say Black Hat. Like, I thought that was a horrible movie, honestly. Like, uh-huh. it didn't do a good job for, like, ICS and, like, Stuxnet. Like, all the whole, the whole nine yards. Sure. But, like, from a criminal standpoint and from, like, a legitimate, like, you know, outside of the Hollywood theme, like that was a pretty good depiction of a black hat hacker and the lifestyle yeah. that they would. Yep. My, 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 my four and five are uh, Tron and the Matrix. Jeff? The Matrix. I'm going to shift gears on you. Uh, four would be Enemy of the, Enemy of the State simply uh-huh. because yes. the bad guy in that yeah. was, a, was a, you know, a real position at NSA and it yeah. used to be my boss. Love so that sort movie. Of for, Love that for movie. nostalgic value. The fifth one, uh, Harrison Ford, Firewall, yep. simply yeah. because the scenario of, okay, so you have two-factor authentication. What happens if somebody puts a gun to your head, mm. which is literally the, the premise of that movie? <laughs> We used to call that uh, nipple clamps in a battery. Yep. 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 The, Larry, the, 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 four and five. I know it's hard. Uh, if I, top three, if you can, if we can all agree on top three, I'm, I'm, I'm happy. But four and five are up for your own interpretation. Like, I have to pull from some of the previous, and I think firewall is a great example. You know, the the rubber hose defense, uh, mm-hmm. and it's not necessarily a hacker That's movie. Okay. That's okay. But. It's about challenging reality and the Matrix. Mm. That's where I went, too. So, yeah, yeah. Number six is Brazil. I'll leave it at that. Oh. I got to watch that one. I have oh. not watched that one yet. Watch that. Oh, Paul, 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 Paul. That's been a long time since I've seen that. I gotta watch uh, that. A, a lot of people also mentioned, honorable mention from our Twitter uh, following, is the uh, Die Hard live free or, or die, die hard, harder right yep. die harder right that that was that was a that was an honorable that would probably uh, that, be number that, six that would be number six in my opinion uh, i think so I, i'd say that's a good total honorable respect mention. if that's in your top five though total respect yep. that yep and, and if you and if you go tv uh mr robot mr robot it was popular from yeah a tv standpoint yep. and then uh there's a csi cyber <laughs> <laughs> there is a CSI well, cyber. Not to, to mention be... the net with Sandra Bullock. Oh, did, some did, people did. Jeff, some side. people did mention the net. 
<laughs> as as well. I have not watched that in a long time. You know what? That'd be really funny to watch now. Oh, I think. Man, that'd be really. The that funniest was... thing at the time was just how she'd open up her laptop and she would have instant access to yeah. whatever she was trying to get, which and it was back in the modem days. Yeah, so at that time, that was not the case. Maybe at it's all. a little bit prescient, and you get that kind of connectivity right. now, but. It, it was that was clearly Hollywood back then. Absolutely. Well, thank you everyone for listening and watching to this edition of Paul Security Weekly. We'll see you next time. Larry, take us out. Over and hackers.